at 7 p.m. Moment of silence, Ms. Cushman. I'd like to in invite you to join me for a moment of silence. And for the Pledge of Allegiance, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Ms. Cushman. Fire evacuation announcement through the double doors in the back, down to the parking lot, out these double doors to my left, your right, down the stairs to the parking lot. Roll call, please. Cushman? Here. Mr. Hamry? Here. Mr. LeBlanc? Mrs. Pickett? Here. Mr. Ryder? Here. Mr. Ungeyer? Here. Mrs. McCree? Here. Dr. Kalman? Here. Madam Chair? Here. Item six, board guests, Mr. Drezek? Thank you, Madam Chair. Tonight we have some very special guests with us, but full disclosure, uh, last board meeting we didn't have board guests. And the reason was because we had just come off a very successful art show and I didn't want to stress out any of our student artists or somebody else who coming off a weekend of an art show to come back here on Tuesday night to talk about it. But in that, um, when I came into the chambers last two Tuesdays ago and I saw all of you displaying your bowls, I figured I would leave my comments about the art show to a minimum because I know you guys were going to talk about it. And in doing so, I failed to thank the most important person of the art show, and that is our K-12 visual arts coordinator, Chris Sascio, who is with us this evening. Um, for those of you who don't may not know Chris, that Chris is the heart and soul behind our art department. The art show is not a, suc a success as it is obviously because of our students, but because of the passion that Mr. Sascio brings. If you were ever walking through any of our st schools and you see student art displayed, it's usually tacked up there by Mr. Sascio. If you're at central office, if you're in my office, none of that happens without Mr. Sascio. So Chris, thank you. It's an amazing uh, event that you put on every year. At this point, I will allow you to welcome the students because you should get some credit. So Mr. Sascio. I'm gonna sit in the middle. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, board members, for having us tonight. Um, I'll be brief, as I know this is really about our students, so. Um, I just I did want to take a moment to share with you the importance of our yearly arts festival. Um, if you've attended this year or any year in the past, uh, you know that our annual arts festival is a pre-K through 12 community celebration of the arts. Each year at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday, um, we transform the HS cafeteria into a large gallery space, which hosts a huge range of creative work from all of our students in Enfield. Um, this year was our 57th annual festival. Um, I began teaching in Enfield the year of our 42nd annual festival. At that time, I was extremely impressed by the community turnout and their support, but I didn't quite understand its importance or how deep the tradition ran. Uh, for 57 years, the EPS Art Department has shared a partnership with the Women's Club of Enfield. Our partnership is really unlike any in the state. Uh, both groups work hard each year to honor and celebrate the arts in Enfield. And uh, we work also work just as hard just to nurture and support that continued partnership. So each year for the past 57 years, the Women's Club have independently fundraised and donated an annual arts festival scholarship to one or more students pursuing higher education in the visual arts. Not even a global pandemic um, has stopped them from fundraising and donating their annual scholarship. Um, in total, the Women's Club have raised and donated over $120,000 in scholarships for EPS students continuing their study of the visual arts. Um, that is no small accomplishment. Um, so if any of the Women's Club members are listening tonight, um, or if you know any of the Women's Club members, please pass along my sincerest gratitude. Um, we appreciate your support and look forward to continuing to work together for many years to come. All right, so secondly, I'd like to take this a moment to acknowledge and thank the Enfield community who come out every year to support the arts. Uh, each year I'm blown away uh, by the community turnout. Um, this year and last year, there was a, a line wrapping around the building. Uh, it was pretty impressive, I thought. Um, I kind of I thought 
we were standing in line to buy concert tickets or something. Maybe it was 20 years ago. Um, so each year, um, so many people in the, fe in the community come out. And uh, I like to think that they all come because art is something we can kind of all universally connect with. Um, all art forms, whether it's visual, musical, dance, written, they're created for the people and really should be accessible by everyone. Um, that's kind of one of our, our, our missions and, and part of our vision behind putting on that festival every year is to really share the work that our students do with the community um, so that they can appreciate it. We, we get to see it all the time. Um, so I'd like to also recognize all of Enfield's young artists. On behalf of our community, I can safely say we are all amazed and inspired by their talent and creativity. We see you, we hear you. It's up to you to make sure your creativity continues to be seen and your voices are always heard. Lastly, I have to take the second to thank all of the former and current teachers of the EPS Art Department. Their tireless work and dedication shine brightly at the Arts Festival, but we know the real work is done every day in their classrooms. They create a safe space where young artists can develop their creative voices and express themselves. And uh, we appreciate everything you do. So thank you to the uh, dedicated teachers of the art department. Okay, I, I'm done. Um, I'd like to introduce our other guests here. Um, they were part of our honors portfolio prep class. I'm extremely proud of the work that they've done this year. They've made amazing gains from September till now. Um, they've really kind of blossomed into like true, unique, creative artists. It's, it, it was really beautiful to see. So this is Lily Ortiz. Uh, this is Amelia Place. Do you Wait. have any? Oh, oh, is it yeah. I think I push the button, maybe. Yeah. Here, I'll turn the. Do we turn the? About our artwork. Sure. Does anybody want to start with any questions or comments, Miss Pickett? Is any of your artwork here? Yeah, it's all up front. This is all of yours. <laughs> no, nah, yeah. Oh my gosh, beautiful. Um, well, thank you for being here. Thank you for the tradition. So a couple comments that I just want to make, and then I do have a question for um, both of you. Um, one is I value the comments you made around the partnership with the Women's Club. I think um, a thriving school system is one that has great community partnership. Um, and I love the work that our school district does to form um, meaningful partnerships to extend you know, opportunities for our students. So I, I too send a thank you to the Women's Club. Um, much programming and the more enhanced work that we're able to do is because of partnerships like that. So I would second those comments um, and along with the student talent um, and the staff that support all of this work, including you. Um, so you're not gonna pat yourself on the back, but I think we can. Um, and your words around art um, and its ability for universal connection, I would completely agree with that. Um, I said in my comments in our last meeting my parents and my sister and my niece were able to attend the show um, and they were jealous that they didn't live in a community that like had this tradition um, but it didn't matter to them because they still loved it and felt like they were part of it even though Enfield's not their home community so I think that speaks even more volumes about the inclusivity of the event and um, the work that you're doing so a question for you students I have little ones that are in elementary school um, and they're always loving opportunities to work with older students so is there opportunities or what are your thoughts of how we can maybe expand art um, to our younger grades. Mm -hmm. Explore your talents earlier. I mean, I saw in the community center that um, there's an opportunity to work with the second graders. I don't know if this is working. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, youth services? Um, yeah. They have like um, a TV screen outside of the career center and it'll display like what's going on each week. I mean, I walked by it and saw that. So I don't know if that's mainly like working with them towards math or whatever, but maybe it could be a segue. Uh -huh. Love that. Um, I think I heard Mr. Sashu does some summer stuff with kids sometimes during oh, summer, like they open up the school and they can do some artwork. That's Which a I great really shameless cool. plug for this art summer program. <laughs> nice answer. Um, perfect. And I, I know my little ones um, had signed up last summer and unfortunately was really enjoying our other summer program that we had going on and didn't want to stop. And so, um, but thank you um, all so much. I'll leave some time for my colleagues, but really nice work and good luck to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hamry. 
Yeah, so I, I want to thank you all for coming here tonight. It was an amazing show, and uh, there's no way to, to uh, overstate the value of having the opportunity to display the work that, that has been created over the over the year. Um, and this is just a comment that, uh, similar to one I made in the last board meeting following that, where I, I brought my collection of uh, pottery in. Uh, I, I have two regrets about the show that it is so compact that there's so many incredible displays in such a small area where everybody's cr you know, crunching to get in there. Um, it, it is a, you know, there's a reason why larger museums are spread out and you got time to contemplate each of the works. Uh, I wish that we had the uh, space available for that kind of uh, opportunity for the work that is put together because it's that kind of amazing. Um, but I also want to throw some uh, shout outs to the other forms of art that are not here tonight, like the, the culinary arts. They were amazing with the soup. I get that every year. That's why I get my bowls. Um, and then the music uh, department with their performances. And uh, again, if you weren't paying, if you weren't watching the last board meeting, I made comments about that, that uh, I was speaking with Mr. Rapucci about the opportunity to bring them literally to a higher stage, elevate that music above so everybody in the room can hear it and you know, add that multimedia dimension to the work that you've all done. And I look forward to that possibly happening in the future. But uh, again, I just want to thank you for everything you've done, for all the work that you've uh, uh, put together and, and the um, statements you've made through your art. And I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Ms. Cushman? I do appreciate the festival as a great opportunity to celebrate art. But just to kind of get an idea if, for you as artists, um, what are your future plans? And also, where, do you, where does your inspiration for art, your artwork, come from? Well, I plan to continue my um, uh, education. I am planning to go to Alfred University, which is way up in New York. Okay. And I'm going to try to study sculpture there and business so I can sell my artwork. Wow. Yeah. Thanks. And I find that my uh, inspiration comes from like things around me. I like to look at things weirdly in different ways, but I also love to read. So I like read a bunch of books and I find that I find inspiration in there too. Right. That's great. Um, <laughs> sorry, nervous laughter. Um, I am planning to go to Manchester Community College just to get prerequisites and then transfer hopefully to Mass Art or Maine College of Art and Design. Mm. I'm not sure exactly where, what I'm going to do yet, but I promise it won't be boring. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a lot of different inspirations for what I do with mm -hmm. my work, but um, I'd say mainly like just stuff that goes on in my mind. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Akri? Uh, thank you, Mr. Siascio. Did I say it right for all that you do as a director and teacher? Um, thank you, girls, and congratulations for sharing your beautiful creations with us. And you did ask, answer already my second question. I wanted to know the same thing. What were your future plans? But thank you so much and good luck. Thank you. you. Dr. Kalman? Um, well, uh, I just wanted to thank you for the wonderful work that you've done. Uh, it's really an inspiration. Uh, and I was really inspired at the, uh, at the art show. It was just, it, as, as always, it was wonderful, a wonderful experience. Um, you had mentioned that uh, you, how, how much you respect the women's club for their life, their long-time association. I can assure you that the feeling is really mutual. Uh, my wife is in the women's club. She was president for a number of years. And I think one of the high points of her, her uh, <clears throat> experience with the women's club is her collaboration with, uh, with you folks uh, on the art project. It, uh, it seems to really charge the people up there and they get very, very excited about the, uh, the art exhibit. So uh, I hope that relationship continues for many, many more years to come. And uh, just a, a thought, um, when, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a number of years ago, my mother-in-law, <clears throat> excuse me, 
you used to go to the Felician Sister daycare. And one of the greatest experiences that she had was being able to paint. Uh, and uh, it would be wonderful if maybe you could develop some sort of a program with the senior center, because I'll bet you there's a lot of potential painters there who just die for the chance to, to learn a little bit about. Uh, I love old people. Great. Well, there's an idea. <laughs> Thank you. I would 100% do that. <laughs> That's a wonderful suggestion. I, I love it. Uh, Mr. Ungar? So I just want to thank you. Thank you for coming here for us today and uh, got a chance to look at some of your paintings and things before um, coming up here. And they're, they're wonderful. That and, and you did them? Yeah, some of them? Both of us did. Both of you did some of them? Okay, terrific. What a, a great skill and talent that you have. But then I noticed this thing up on, on there. This is uh, looks like a, some sort of praying mantis. Is that a Is that a sculpture or what do you call that? Yeah, that's my cardboard playing mantis I had to do for sculpture class. Now, um, before I did this, I had to do the giant gourd down there. <laughs> so I got comfortable with cardboard very quickly <laughs> from doing that. So I wanted to challenge myself by making a playing mantis. Well, you can see there's a lot of detail with that. And it must have taken you a long time to do that. How long did it take you to do that? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was in the same class as her. We both had portfolio and we both had sculpture at the same time. So we both had to make a cardboard bug. I made a dragonfly. They probably took us around two months. Two months, yeah, I could see that, yeah. Well, thank you, thank you. They're beautiful. Okay, I'll just add, um, I love going to the art show every year. Um, I really appreciate your shout out to the Enfield Women's Club um, and recognizing their support um, because we support the art um, that art show every year. And it is the women's club that does really go the extra mile to bring people in and having the raffle prizes lately. But every aspect of the art show really opens your eyes to the talent that we have um, in town, even starting with our littles. One of the things I'm always in awe of is when I go to where you guys all have your portfolio on the wall. And I kind of feel like all the, the, your art, the artists in Enfield High um, you're so un unassuming about your talent. Um, you guys are very like almost a little bit shy about really delving into what this painting represents. Um, but you're incredible artists. And I think also for you guys, you're really putting on display um, your imagination or perhaps you started something on a day you were feeling some sort of way and you finished it. But um, one thing's for sure, you can tell everything you do in your art, whether it's a praying mantis, a gourd, or one of your paintings, every cut, every stroke, every everything is, is very intentional and thought out. And I can just imagine how wonderful your imaginations are. So I appreciate your work. Um, any ideas that you have, I mean, hey, we can, you and Dr. Jerry here, get this going. Um, I'd love to see that, but I really appreciate your work and we all do and coming out tonight and sharing that with us. So thank you again. Thank you. So we're gonna give you guys a moment to clear your artwork and. <laughs> thank you for your support and for inviting us out tonight. Thank you.
Okay, we'll move on to item seven, the superintendent's report. Item A, Mr. Dresick. Morgan, you're up. I need to move this. Hello there, everyone. I have a lovely list to present to you tonight. <laughs> Since it is now the month of May, AP exams have started. Everyone's favorite season of studying and staying up late. So the exams are ending this Thursday, so congratulations to anyone and everyone that is brave enough to take AP classes and these exams. I give you credit. All right, seniors, please, senior parents, seniors, if you're watching this, friends of seniors, anyone, you need to listen to this because this is gonna decide for the rest of our months of June and the end of May. Our prom tickets are completely sold. We have sold over 400 of them, so thank you so much for everything you have done. Our senior class picnic and class night are being sold now. You need to make sure you are filling out the forms. You can find those in Ms. Aiken's office and the payments need to be made to her before May 19th to be added to the list. Our senior class dues for our tassels and graduation gown and anything like that is needs to be turned in by May 26th to Ms. Moyer in her office. Safegrad is in full effect now. Make sure you are filling out the form. This was sent to us through email last Thursday or Friday, it is $10 to attend and this form and your $10 payment can be made in cash or check it needs to go to Miss Aiken's office. EHS Chorus and Orchestra is having a concert tomorrow the 10th in the EHS Auditorium at 6.30. The EHS Band and Concert, EHS Band is having a concert May 18th in the EHS Auditorium at 6.30. Wednesday, May 3rd, we had our last blood drive of the year. Thank you to all the teachers and students that gracefully, gracefully donated for us. If you are interested in student council and you have already turned in your permission slips and everything that needed to be done, this spring election will be held May 23rd. Any candidates that are running need to have their videos and their flyers turned into Ms. Dolan, please, hopefully by the end of this Friday. On May 24th, the 8th graders will be coming to visit Enfield High School. I hope to see I hope to see everyone being nice and courteous to all of these 8th graders so they know what's coming up. La almost done. Oh my goodness. Awards and Scholarship Night is May 31st at the EHS Auditorium. If you have received an award or a scholarship, you will be getting a letter in the mail in the next week or two. Grades have officially closed for progress reports for all of our grades. Guys, we're halfway there. We can do it. I believe in all of us. And major shout out to all of our teachers and anyone that is in our building and, and around our entire town. You make an entire difference in all of our lives every single day. Now, on to a lot of people's favorite part, part sports. The boy baseball, they beat Maloney yesterday, six to one. Congratulations. And they have a game, they have an away game tomorrow at 345. Softball has a home game tomorrow against E.L. Smith at 345 down at the turret. Oh my gosh, down at the field. Track and field has a meet today against Tolland and East Lime. Golf had a tournament today home against E.L. Smith. Boys tennis is having a match tomorrow against East Catholic at 345. This will be an away match. Girls Tennis had a match today against East Catholic, and I'm waiting to hear back on what happened. Boys Lacrosse, they have an away game on May 11th against Maloney Platt at 345. Look, Girls Lacrosse had a game today home at 345 against Bristol Eastern, and I'm waiting for that score, and that is all I have for you today. Thanks, Morgan. Uh, just three quick items, Madam Chair. The first is it's not on your agenda this evening, um, but if you recall back in February when the board adopted the 23-24 school year calendar, um, I believe we had mentioned this was a unique year when we were trying to line up April vacations. And typically what we do is try to line up with districts that are in our area. Um, we've looked at that from a geographic standpoint. And one of the things we overlooked was during that April vacation break, uh, time, um, particularly for our high school athletic programs, if we don't line up with the teams in our conference, we essentially run the risk of losing two weeks worth of competition because if we can't schedule something while we're out and then the opposing team, if we're not on the same thing, and we, and I thank Kathy for doing a, a lot of research on essentially 
with the exception of two, dis two, two schools in the same district, so a, high, a, a town with two high schools, uh, we didn't line up with anybody in our, th in the, in our athletic conference, um, including, and the other thing we found out since then is we also don't line up with the dance studio's trips to Disney by the week that we had chosen. I, I don't know if that's true, but I was told. Um, so I did have to reach out to our bargaining units as part of the protocol to recommend that we may have to make that change. We wanted to get that out to families as soon as possible. I know people plan tri April, break, April trips. Um, a year in advance, um, but what we would recommend back to the board for the next meeting is to alter next year's calendar from April break being the week of the 15th through the 19th to changing that to the week of the 8th to the 12th so that it lines up more with not just athletics, but some of our DECA events and things along those lines to make sure we're in line with the schools that we compete with. Um, and the last two things that are really quick, I am terrible at remembering special occasions. Um, Kathy will attest to that as well. But I can't go uh, this, today. I purposely didn't send anything out this week to two very special groups. Uh, one is in particular tomorrow, so the teachers will have to wait till the end of the week. Um, but this week, and I don't want to steal your thunder, is a, two very special appreciation weeks for two very special groups. One being Teacher Appreciation Week and the other being Nurses Week. Um, and I can't think of, now that we're coming out of lifting the fog a bit over the last couple of years, um, Two groups, and, I, and everybody's included in that, but in particular, people who were literally on the front lines during what we've been through over the last two years, or last three years. Um, and I can't help but remember that it was a year ago this week um, that I sat in this spot and pleaded with members of the public, if you have college students coming home and they want to come to work, please send them to us because we can't keep school open. The reason we're able to keep school open is because our Teachers, if they got it, they took their five days and then they came back right away. And usually if there was anybody who had it, the first place they went was their nurse. Um, so there's not a lot of things I can say with a lot of confidence these days, but the one thing I can say is we would not have made it without our teachers and our nurses over the last several years. So there's a million ways to say thank you. Thank you is not enough. A week is not enough. Um, but to our teachers and our nurses, you, I've, you've all probably driven by a school and seen signs out and you probably see things in your social media world, that part I miss. Um, I've even seen things um, being floated around the office. Um, take a moment to appreciate yourselves. Take a moment to let it sink in. You, don't, you only get one week. <laughs> Some people only get one day. Um, and, and a lot of our, our, our staff members, particularly our teachers and our, and our nurses, they don't want credit. Um, but for once, take it and enjoy it and revel in it. Um, because I can tell you, there's no way we would be where we are now over the last couple of years without this group of people. So thank you guys, um, thank everybody. Um, and that will conclude the superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Drezek. Item eight, audiences. Okay, it looks like we have two speakers, so I will allow four minutes. Um, Zach Zanoni. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is the first time I've spoken at a Board of Ed meeting, believe it or not. I am a town council boy, and part of the reason is related to a council matter. And that is with, oh, Just did your I address. Howard Street. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> And that is that I have gotten word that the entire Republican caucus of the town council has endorsed a $1.4 million cut to our school system. Um, it's a little peculiar that it wasn't made public. And if people are watching right now, they might say, where in a meeting was this mentioned? It wasn't. It was mentioned last meeting that a proposed cuts were sent into our town manager. When I reached out to a town councilor from the caucus about seeing it, I was told it was not public. I didn't like that answer, so I FOI'd it. And within that is $1.4 million cut. Perhaps maybe the reason that we didn't want to make that very public, but I will make that public. And I am incredibly distraught because I think anybody that understands education knows that it is not numbers. These are people's lives. These are teachers. These are students. This is staff. $1.4 million is not cutting pencil boxes out of the budget. You are cutting teachers. 
you are cutting staff, you are rolling back programs. And I find it incredibly ironic, especially because there are individuals who continually attack that man, attack this board, and claim that our schools are failing, and they believe the solution is to roll back what we already have. This budget being proposed by the Board of Ed does nothing to enhance education. It maintains what we already have. So you're stating that we need to roll back well, I say you're when I'm referring to what they're proposing. They're stating we need to roll back what already exists. How can we move forward as a district when we can't even maintain what we have? And with that in mind tonight, I would like to ask the three Republican Board of Ed members if they are in agreement with what their colleagues on the council have proposed. And I, I'm sure that you were in conversations with them. And it's unfortunate because I know there are people on the council that have sat on the Board of Ed. They know $1.4 million. It's not like capital improvement on the, on the town council. You're not cutting trucks. You're cutting programs. You're cutting people. And that is a significant impact to our schools. And I think if we're going to have a serious conversation about what our values are as a town, our values should not be to the people looking here. Not only do we not want to maintain what we have, we want to roll back what already exists. And I find that incredibly concerning as a resident, as someone who is an educator, and as someone who studies education at the University of Connecticut, all of which is just, I mean, it's incredibly distressing. Like I've mentioned, I have never had to come before you ever. And hearing $1.4 million is mind blowing. And the fact that it, they decided not to publicize it is even more concerning and even more telling because I think it's playing politics. Thank you, Madam Chair. Marcy Telesio, Coolidge Drive. Um, so yes to what Zach's saying. I didn't know about that. Um, so I haven't been because I'm dealing with my own personal Board of Ed stuff, but it's come to my attention just yesterday that there's some, I don't know, controversy communications about teachers having rainbow flags on their classroom doors um, and that being an issue. Um, so I wanted to just, you know, leave it to me to, to, to bring forward a statute or school policy. Um, I would encourage any Board of Ed member to um, get familiar with these your own policies um, and even turn around and read the bottom of that slide there. It says, make a difference in Enfield every child every day. And that's what we're here to do. And you are not to bring forth your own opinions, your own personal beliefs. Uh, leave that at home. Or don't run for the board, because you're here to represent every child and to make sure that we're supporting every child, regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation. Um, Run the gamut. We're talking about a person, a child you are here to support. You leave your beliefs at home or you don't run for Board of Ed. It's as simple as that. And I really, like I said, I encourage you to read uh, a couple of your own policies and I'll let you know 9012 you should get familiar with and 0523. And I think that it's absolutely a disgrace that we have somebody or people on the board that want to take away supports and allies for our LGBTQ plus community. I think that's awful. These students need support and our teachers are willing to give it. Why on earth would anybody suggest that we don't do that? So again, every child every day or don't run for the Board of Ed. Audiences is now closed. We're moving on to number nine, board member comments. Ms. Cree. Good evening. I'd like to start off with wishing our infield teachers happy Teacher Appreciation Week. Uh, I would like to thank the wonderful teachers that we have in our district for their dedication, their diligence, 
as they prepare our young Enfield students for successful and productive lives by helping our students achieve their goals. That's part of their job every day, having, and to make sure that the students will have flourishing careers in their futures. So thank you, teachers. Um, from the desk of Mr. Dupair at Prudence Crandall, he states, we are currently in the midst of the smart balanced assessment testing. Students are working extremely hard. He would also like to thank his teachers. He says, a big special thank you to all of our incredible teachers at Prudence Crandall and that the school would not be who it is and where it is without such great teachers. There are some important dates I'd like to uh, announce. On May 15th, there is a grade three field trip to the Riverside Reptile Education Center. Also on May 15th, there's a virtual Crandall Barnard PTO meeting at 6.30 in the evening. On May 17th, there is a Crandall Spring Chorus and Instrumental Concert at Enfield High School. And the, that concert begins at 6.30. Uh, from May 22nd to May 25th, the Community Health Center's mobile dental program will be at Crandall for preventative dental services. And on May 30th, there is an author's visit by Jean Ferolio. Uh, lastly, I did attend the Spring Music Showcase at Enfield High School on April 26th with some of the board members. We were all there. Um, it featured the amazing musicians from the orchestra, the jazz band, the honors chorus, and the concert band. And in the concert band, um, student Autumn LeDuc was the United Sound Musician. And it was great watching Autumn perform on her, perform on her percussion instrument. Um, the students, of course, sounded wonderful in each of the ensembles. Great job. Kudos to the music teachers, Ashley Shell, Amanda Tillman, Michael Stewart, the pianist, and Raymond Cole, the director. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Cree. Dr. Kelman. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I would also like to uh, extend my appreciation to the teachers uh, this week. And they, they do such a, a terrific job uh, and, and so selflessly. I'd also like to recognize the school nurses um, because I think too often uh, people tend to think of the nurse as just a passive person there just to kind of follow the doctor's orders, take the doctor's orders and execute them. But there's so much more of that. They are the leaders the, 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 of the health program uh, in the schools. Um, so they play an active role in training and orientation and supervision. Um, so they, they do an incredible job and, and I think that too often they go unrecognized. So I just wanted to take a moment to thank them for their hard work. So. Um, uh, as a pediatrician who practiced in Enfield for well over 30 years, I'm, I'm very worried about the future of our town. Uh, as all of us know, our children are our highest priority, uh, and the school system plays a critical role in nurturing their development. In loco parentis is certainly a misnomer for a school system in place of a parent. A school is not a glorified babysitter. It partners with the child and the family to open up all sorts of possibilities for the child's future. And it also acts to help ensure the child's health and wellness and uh, secure nutritional status. When families consider moving into a new town, the first question they ask is, what are the schools like? The town council is considering slashing the school budget. $1.4 million, don't let them do it. Kids don't have a voice in the town government, but you do. 
let them know that you won't let them use the future of our children to finance the budget. The cost is far too dear. With respect to Kite, uh, as the School Readiness Council for the Town of Enfield, Kite formally approved the OEC School Readiness Continuation Grant at the May 3rd meeting. And uh, as you know, uh, this continuation grant has already been approved by the Board of Education and the Town Council. Uh, most of the last Kite meeting was spent addressing the upcoming five-year Enfield Early Childhood Community Plan. And specifically, the meeting was facilitated by David Bechtel and broken into focus groups to address three major categories of community challenges. First, children are ready to succeed in school and life. Secondly, children are healthy, safe, and happy. And finally, thriving families. Uh, the leadership team will finalize a report in June and present it to the Kite membership for approval. Uh, and finally, Head Start. Uh, Head Start held its annual self-assessment on May 5th, and the topics reviewed included family engagement, collaboration, attendance, health and wellness, uh, family needs, and innovative proposals for consideration. The resulting themes, together with analysis of the 2022-23 data, will be evaluated and presented in a report to be generated later this year. That concludes my report. Thank you. Ms. Cushman? Um, just being the nurse and teacher appreciation week, I did want to take the time to um, just express appreciation for all of our teachers, administrators, for everyone, even the paraprofessionals, everyone that works with our students, and for nurses as well. I just I look forward to you know hearing the stories of how you were um, how appreciation was expressed by students, just thinking about how. We were showered with such gifts and great um, words of appreciation. I, I pray that this will be the same for you this week and you'll feel especially um, appreciated and loved. Um, the Enfield Together Coalition, which recently hosted a virtual vaping presentation for parents, is hosting two more virtual workshops on May 11th for parents, guardians, and community members. Um, the first is offered on May 11th from 3 to 4 p.m. It's called Prevention in the Digital Age. Um, and this one focuses on how we can take what we know about prevention and ensure that it is received by youth in a way that sparks change. The second one is a virtual workshop from 6.30 to 7.30 that's raising a drug-free teen. And this one encourages parents... Um, to talk with their children. It says talking with your teen about difficult topics is both one of the hardest and one of the most important things you will do as a parent. And this workshop will help you with those conversations. These workshops are prevent, presented by Andy Duran, who's the chief executive officer of LEAD. LEAD stands for Linking Efforts Against Drugs. It's a nationally recognized prevention organization. To access information and the links to RSV, RSVP for these workshops, um, visit EnfieldSchools.org, and from the community heading, select Enfield Together Coalition from the drop-down menu, and click on Virtual Workshops. For the parents and guardians of the current fifth grade students at Parkman, Eli Whitney and Prudence Crandall, the administration at JFK Middle School is hosting an informational night for all parents and guardians of incoming sixth grade students on Tuesday, May 30th from 6.30 to 8 in the JFK Auditorium. The Enfield PTO website is where you can RSVP as well as to suggest questions or topics you would like addressed. And that's all. Thank you, Ms. Cushman. Mr. Hamry? Thank you. Uh, as usual, I'm going to start off with the uh, JFK PTO updates. Uh, as Ms. Cushman just mentioned, the grade uh, sixth incoming students are welcome to attend the informational night at JFK on May 30th, 6.30 to 8 p.m. Again, RSVPing through their website. Uh, so I'll save the details for you to visit that website to register for that uh, 
incoming group. I want to encourage as many parents and families that are in that category to attend and explore all that there is to take in at JFK because the offerings are incredible. Um, also from Leslie at the PTO, and I, I do want to apologize to the uh, JFK PTO. Their meeting is happening as we speak, and clearly I can't be there. And um, it's unfortunate that I get to miss out on those PTO meetings because it's usually the same night as these meetings. Um, but back to Leslie's updates, uh, the student versus faculty basketball game will be held next Friday, May 19th from 6 to 8 p.m. on the outdoor basketball courts. This event is free and open to the public. There will be raffles and lots of chances to win other prizes as well as some local food trucks. And I believe that that's the same event that Mr. Ryder DJed last year to help support that. It was a fantastic time. And if the weather holds up, it's going to be even better this year. Uh, check out the main newsletter for all of the important upcoming dates regarding field trips and end of the year eighth grade activities. And once again, thank you to Leslie and everybody in the JFK PTO, Dr. Berrios and uh, the entire group that's supporting the JFK, uh, JFK kids. <clears throat> in no particular order for the other concerns I've got, and I apologize in advance, this is going to take a minute. One of first, I'm going to start off with the audiences first. Uh, Mr. Zanoni, I appreciate your uh, comments, and I don't usually respond to, board, to a public statement, but that the budget proposal to cut the funding to the district was not made public is terrible. It's just flat out terrible. Um, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, Ms. Delicio, I hear you very loudly, very clearly. And I appreciate and respect the, the, the uh, sentiment that is behind me on the board. All students, every day, every student, all the time, without fail, without fail. Um, to your question that you presented to the Republican side of the table up here, Republican side of the day, it's not one of them answered your question. And I, I don't, don't think I didn't notice that. Um, I do want to highlight that they appreciate this, the teachers. They appreciate the nurses. They want to cut the budget. And they don't want to respect your question by answering the question. So it's kind of a, 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 a two-sided a, a, a approach to that. Like, we appreciate the teachers, but we want to not pay for them. Uh, I'm sorry. It's Teacher Appreciation Week, and I really don't know how to appreciate the teachers more than by supporting the budget that keeps them in place, that keeps them in a position to help the students that need it, to help those that are at most risk because of society's disregard for them as individuals, despite the fact that they're humans. Now, I'm a little biased because I work in the human services field, and I see what happens with children that are allowed to be abused, allowed to be disregarded, allowed to be made to feel inferior because of who they are and what they become as adults through no fault of their own. So pardon me for being a little offset by the fact that we don't have a true appreciation for, this for the uh, people that are here to, to administer to the children's needs and their education. And support and appreciate indeed. Um, tomorrow night, again, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here. Tomorrow night at 7 p.m. in the uh, Enfield High School Auditorium. Again, I am so many things going on this week. I wish I could be here for this thing at Enfield High. But the Enfield High Youth Vote presentation on the 19th Amendment and its legacy is happening. And I, I hope it's televised. I'm pretty sure it's televised. If not, you know, maybe I, somebody can... Stream it live and I'll watch it later. Okay, it's going to be live. Great. Then I'll watch it when I can. It's going to be a really good conversation and uh, the entire community will benefit from what they're going to be talking about. Um, so in the last month, um, not that anybody asks us what I do out in my spare time, but uh, in the last month I was uh, helpful to a certain degree with the Enfield High School Lamp Ladders production of Sound of Music. They didn't need my help to the extent that uh, I was willing to offer it, and that's great because they have a lot of talented folks that are putting those shows together and the students that make it happen. Um, so kudos to everybody that brought that sound of music to the absolute wonderful production that it was. Um, even more to the, uh, the same kind of uh, appreciation and love to the JFK production of Newsies Jr. that happened last week. Um, by the JFK Drama Club. There's no way to underestimate the 
amount of time, effort, intensity that goes into these productions by students that are taking care of their academics as well. You know, their, their calendars are quite full during the uh, lead up to their production weeks. Um, I do want to take a moment to shine a, a, a light on the audio at JFK, uh, the auditor, audit, audio in the auditorium. Uh, we sat up here listening to a uh, conversation about how the, the building was on time and under budget. I can guarantee you that one of the places we saved money on that building was in the auditorium, where there is zero audio installed. So. We have a production that put on stage something north of 40 of our students over there, probably more, but I lost count. 40 or so students that were involved in the production on stage, not just the, not counting the ones that are backstage and behind the scenes, uh, 40 students on stage involved in that production, and we have an audio system that doesn't exist. The, uh, the staff over there um, were able to put together a audio system that was piecemeal, and um, it was opening night, a challenge to say the least. It was to the point where after that show, and I, I am known in town because of these moments, I assume, um, but a, a, a parent came up to me after that production, and I was not wearing any kind of insignia, I was not wearing any kind of JFK logo, came up to me and said, can we as parents do something to have a fundraiser to put some sound in this room? So um, if we're on time and under budget, can we put that, some of that extra budget into microphones, into a soundboard, into something that's going to help make those children that put everything on, their, on the stage uh, able to hear them, to, to appreciate what they're doing and make their voices literally heard? Again, appreciation to everybody that was involved in that production. Um, at one of the uh, recent, I think it was the last board meeting, and I apologize, it's been a heck of a month and um, I tend to get my dates confused sometimes, but I think it was the last board meeting where I uh, asked the chair uh, to consider removing Mrs. Cushman from the policy committee because of uh, statements and uh, processes uh, that were, uh, policies rather, that were uh, offered up in ways that would diminish the, uh, the rights and uh, minimize the uh, LGBTQIA plus community, and I want to revisit that. I want to request again that uh, Ms. Cushman be removed from the policy committee because a point, uh, among, a point of order. Excuse me, um, Madam Chair. No, Mr. No, Ungeier, you've already ruled making, on this, Mr. This is, Ungeier, It's for me to decide. He is free to you, speak you've during decided, his, Mr. Ungeier, I'm not arguing with you. Why do we have to? It is Mr. Hamry's time to talk and express his I'm concerns. I'm calling a point of order. There's no point. You've of order. already decided this. I can answer for myself. But you, you and next week you're going to decide again on something else. I can else? answer you, for myself. I've already spoken to Ms. Cushman. I've spoken to Mr. Hamry. I've spoken to the board, but if Mr. Hamry would like to express concern, that is up He's to him. He's bringing it up again. Okay. He's asking for you to consider. Okay. You've already made your decision on okay. this. Okay. We have our time at the dais during our board member comments to bring up what we would like. Please finish, Mr. Hamry. It was on February 8th, 2022 at this dais where Ms. Cushman used the phrase social contagion to describe transgender students, transgender in general. And... Um, I go back to that moment because it does speak to the motivations that come with the proposals to enact policies that do limit the uh, freedoms of the LGBTQ plus community. So um, with all due respect, Mr. Ungeier, during my comments where I have every right to say whatever crosses my mind, trust I will. Oh, I don't doubt it. I don't. I do not ask her. However, I did not please ask, stop you, the back and forth. Point, point of order. Yeah, yeah, now there's a point of order. Please stop the back and forth. I would again respectfully request that she be removed from the policy subcommittee, so that we do not have to have any more further discussions that limit or otherwise reduce any of our demographics to anything less than what they are. Thank you, Mr. Ungar. So I think I'll have to start by um, having to, um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hamry, um, criticize this caucus for not answering Mr. Z uh, Zanoni's uh, remarks up there. Um, I have to remind Mr. Hamry that we are instructed 
that there's no back and forth with people who are coming up and giving comments. Okay, so for you to say, well, nobody answered that his question, and um, because we're not permitted to answer his question, so and um, so I just have to remind you of that, Mr. Hamry. So, um, Mr. Uh, Zernoni, just to to address your point, okay, the points that you made up there on a, on a couple of things, okay. Um, and you said, oh, well, you, you know, we're probably aware of the, the amount that is being proposed or whatever. I can tell you that um, I was not aware of what the internal negotiations are. Okay, I'm closer probably than most to the town council. And you came out with that number, and I was not aware uh, of that number. Okay. Um, and the only way I think that you found it, you said that you, you, did a, you ran a freedom of information um, request to get that number, okay? So um, I have faith that the process of negotiation, which the town is going through right now, will will come up with a budget that will be acceptable to everybody. I think that, uh, um, you know, we've done it in the past. We're doing it now. I've got faith in the process. And, you know, you pointed out the, the Republican caucus, but bear in mind, re remember this, that the majority on the town council is not Republican. It's Democrat. Any, any, any budget that does pass is going to pass with uh, a, a majority. Okay? So just, I'm just making that point. Thank you. Um, would like to thank uh, the Women's Club for their contributions to, um, to our scholarships for the Enfield School students. And, and, and doctor, I know that you are sensitive to nurses uh, with Teacher Appreciation Week. Um, I, I'm glad that you, you brought that out. Um, you're sens I'm sensitive to teachers too. Um, I sent out a note to um, my favorite teacher in the Enfield Public School Systems, um, telling him he's a history teacher at the JFK Middle School, telling him how much I appreciate his efforts in, in teaching, teaching our kids. Uh, Buzz Robotics Open House, tomorrow night, Wednesday, at the Enfield Annex from 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. And come on out, everybody, and see what they're doing with Buzz Robotics tomorrow evening, Wednesday. And this is National Prevention Week, May 7th through the 13th. And, and it doesn't say, you know, just drug prevention. So we're so often seeing, you know, drug prevention. But this is national prevention. It deals more than just drug misuse. It deals with suicide prevention. It deals with mental health, smoking, vaping, drinking, drug misuse, um, sponsored by the Enfield Together Coalition, to just... Uh, just to add a little bit onto what Ms. Cushman had said about this virtual event that's coming on May 11th, um, it says that teens who don't drink or use drugs say that the number one reason they have made that choice is because of their parents, the involvement of their parents in their lives. And um, so encouraging parents to join this virtual workshop um, raising a drug-free teen on May 11th from 6.30 to 7.30. For so parents, it's only an hour of your time. And you can call Tessa Rydell. She's the prevention coordinator at the Department of Social Services here in Enfield. And her number is area code 860-253-6382. Again, that's Tessa Rydell at 860-253-6382. And I was fortunate enough to attend just prior to this meeting. The town of Enfield sponsored, um, along with uh, the Enfield Together Coalition, a community conversation on opioids and substance misuse. I see some of our folks here in, in the uh, attending here t today were there. And um, one of the one of the things one of the statistics that they noted was that in Connecticut alone in in 2022 that some 
1,500 people died of, of opioid overdoses, 1,500 people. So that goes back to getting parents involved with their, with their children and having open conversations with them. Um, uh, and uh, that's, that's what I have. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pickett? Um, I will start my comments by thanking teachers and staff. Um, it's a special week. I thank you every day, but it is a special week. Um, and I know our school and our PTO worked hard to have some creative things um, for our students to do. And tonight before I came here, it's always hard to leave my little ones. Um, and it's a busy May, so I'm leaving them a lot. Um, so my daughter was upset and I was like, oh, draw a picture for the meeting. Um, so she started. Um, so she wrote, we love you and her teacher is Miss Bradway. So I'm going to give a personal shout out. Um, and then my son came out of the bath and quickly added um, all teachers too. Um, um, so all teachers, not just Miss Bradway, um, but sincerely, um, what you do each day, um, I cannot even put into words how much um, I'm thankful for, for you. Um, so in many ways, I feel like the school year is wrapping up. Um, so I'd like to pose a couple of questions or comments. Um, one, through the chair to the superintendent. As a parent, I received a survey. It seems like it might be a school climate survey. Is that going out district-wide for all schools? Um, and is that something that will be shared um, with us about how that information is used? That's it's all schools. And that's part of the conversation that we had with our, our representatives from CREC on the equity study. Perfect. Thank you. Um, helpful. Uh, the other kind of pieces is really, I know you had um, some meetings with the parent advisory. Um, so thinking about how many of those have happened, what have we gleaned from those conversations? I don't expect you to answer that right now. Um, and how is that information being used along with those bigger equity efforts? So thinking about, um, you know, what did we hear from those focus groups and how are we planning um, you know, for things for next year, because it's going to be next year before we know it. Um, a couple other pieces, Enfield Street School, again, it's Teacher Appreciation Week. Um, families, I encourage you always to look at the parent newsletter, but also if you're on Facebook, the PTO page is another helpful place. They've posted all of the week's um, special little things along with the teacher list. So if you're not sure what your teacher um, loves or what you can do, they've gotten some great resources there. So I encourage you to check those out. Um, Another thank you to teachers. We had a literacy night um, book fair in partnership with the PTO and the school staff. Um, amazing. Seeing my kids' favorite part was seeing the teachers like serve ice cream and be in the school with them outside of school hours. Um, and as a parent, it just feels so good to be in the school and with our staff um, and sharing in those memories together. There's many upcoming assemblies and field trips, so please, parents, make sure you are checking your child's backpack newsletters um, and staff communication, parent, um, teacher communications. A comment I'd like to make, um, a reminder um, possibly to you, Mr. John Unghier, is we cannot engage in a back and forth. That is true. Um, but you are free to engage in your comments with whatever comments are brought forth in the audience, which in fact I know you've done before because you've actually read letters from folks. So you can feel free to engage with whatever comments might be made from audience members as you choose. Um, and so with that, I would like to address the budget, even if you don't have prior knowledge of that. Hearing um, a significant cut like that um, has left me really worried um, and confused because I recall on April 5th, we sat here with our town council counterparts um, and they said things like, we need to put our kids first. We need to do what's right. A good school system is the starting point of your community. Um, and then they ask us to take a significant cut. Um, so we currently don't have enough resources. I'm going to echo those pieces, things like supplies. I know we're already buckling down and our teachers already support so much of the classroom. Um, supports summer programming as a parent who benefited greatly from that. Like those are cuts that we've already made. Um, and the thought of having to do more is really upsetting. Um, we also need to recognize that we rely heavily on the partnership with the town um, for our buildings and grounds and custodial services. And many times I feel like we're the forgotten stepchild. So um, voters, again, if you're concerned about your community and schools, I encourage you to be active and informed. Thank you, Ms. Pickett. Mr. Ryder? So as for the budget, Although the budget that this school board passed on to the town council had a small increase, two point something percent, it was all cost of living. There was no extra programs, there was no extra staffing included in that. That was, is to maintain where we're at now, still playing catch up from the years of COVID, et cetera. 
$1.4 million would be approximately 30 staffers, if not more. Our buildings need more adult bodies, more educators, more support staff, more behavioral techs, more teachers, not approximately 30 less. So I hope that the superintendent and the school board's budget is approved as requested. Tomorrow is School Nurses Day, May 10th. And this, of course, is Teacher and Staff Appreciation Week. We never called it Teacher Appreciation Week in the schools that I was running the PTOs in. We always called the Teacher and Staff Appreciation because there are separate days for bus drivers and there are separate days for paras. But we took this second week in May, the first full calendar week of May, to always appreciate all of our adults in the building. And I've said that countless times here. That is our classroom teachers. That is our custodians. That is our lunch staff. Every adult in our building lends a hand and how our kids spend their day in that building that we call a school. So to all the teachers and staff in our school buildings, I appreciate you. And I thank you for how you've helped educate not only my children, but 5,000 others just this current school year and every year. Um, I have an update from Eli Whitney. Um, we talked about this a couple weeks ago that they're doing a contest where you could write essays to become either our principal, assistant principal, or chief of staff of the day. And our essay contest winners will be performing these roles this Thursday. Are we going? I believe we're going. <laughs> trying to talk our chair into taking a work from home day and sneaking over to Eli Whitney so we can meet the following. Maddie in grade five will be our principal for the day. Emma in grade four is our assistant principal for the day. And our chief of staff will be Kiara in grade three. Uh, also, uh, it's uh, Spirit Week this week, coinciding with Staff Appreciation Week, and tomorrow is Dress Like Your Future Career Day. So we anticipate on seeing some future uh, teachers this, uh, tomorrow. Uh, next Thursday is PJ for Pause. The Enfield Police Department Canine Unit will be coming back to do a demonstration, and students are encouraged to wear their pajamas that day. And they can make an optional $1 donation to the EPD, which goes to the, specifically to the Canine Unit uh, for their care and food and et cetera, uh, toys, uh, but things specifically for the Canine Unit of the EPD. So I think that's a great thing over at Whitney. And I do plan to be there on Thursday to meet the student principal, student assistant principal, and student chief of staff of the day. Um, I think that's everything for this week. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start my board member comments. Um, I, I just wanted to direct a, a question to the Republican caucus. And I, I don't feel that this is contentious or putting you on the spot. Um, but from what I understand, you feel Ms. Cushman is the representative that you would like on the policy committee. You support the policy she brings forward, and you feel that she is a good representative for your caucus, correct? Correct. Okay. So I guess in turn for that, if the Republican caucus supports Ms. Cushman being their representative on the committee, no matter who we have on the committee, they're going to have the same ideals, they're going to have the same policies that they would like to bring forward. So there's four of them. Mr. LeBlanc isn't here, but if they feel that Ms. Cushman is the proper representative, she's actually representing their whole caucus. So no matter who we have up there, is still gonna be representative of how their caucus feels. So that's where I'm leaving that. Are you okay with that? I'm okay with that. Okay, and that's how I feel. We, on our side, rep put representatives on curriculum and policy who we felt represent our caucus. You guys put Miss Cree on curriculum. That was wonderful. You put a former teacher on curriculum. Jean loves to talk about curriculum. So I think that when we made these committees, they were, and I said this last time, we put who we believe was gonna represent our caucus. So whether you're changing out different members, I think you're still gonna have those same beliefs brought forward. And I'm going to stand on how these committees were formed and how we're gonna go forward. I understand your frustration, Mr. Hamry. I understand. 
So I just want everybody to take a deep breath because I think we have work weight that we have to do. And as a chair, I'm trying to keep the work going and I can't make everybody happy and I can't make everybody meld together, but I listen to both sides and I feel comfortable with who's on the committee because that's who repre who's representing the opposing caucuses. So I just wanted to put that out there. So that's how I feel about that. So um, a couple other things I wanted to bring up like rather quickly. Um, first of all, thank you to the teachers and staffs for teacher and staff appreciation week. Um, I appreciate you always. Um, you've been my village. I really appreciate um, everything you've done for my families and continue to do for the families in our schools. And this doesn't just stop at teachers. It, it goes to paras, um, librarians, lunch aides, um, secretaries, everyone. Um, the other thing I want to give a shout out to the nurses. Um, the school nurses are amazing, but I also want to give a shout out to nurses in general, especially my favorite nurse, um, Regina, who is my favorite cardiology nurse at Hartford Hospital. Um, I had firsthand knowledge of how hard it is to be a nursing student today and actually pass the NCLEX. So whoever is thinking about being a nurse or going through nursing school, um, I give you a lot of credit because I think your college experience has been quite different than other college experiences. And if you're sitting around with um, flashcards. I've seen it. <laughs> I've seen it all. So um, good luck to you. We have one update for SafeGrad. Um, Leslie Lawler mes message and said SafeGrad packets are due by May 26th. If returned by May 12th, students will, re will earn extra raffle tickets. There's a Powder Hollow fundraiser this Friday night. This is an exciting one, senior parents. There's a raffle going on for one front row parking spot for graduation. Tickets are $10 each. Online payments are accepted by Venmo or PayPal. And there will be a live drawing on Thursday, June 1st. Spread the rumor. Spread the, not the rumor, spread the message. Maybe you could put it out on the EHS Student Council page or something. <laughs> um, I also went to the concert April 26th. Um, it was very short ensembles, but it was it was beautiful. Again, um, the talent that we have in our schools is amazing. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is for Kite. Um, Kite recognized our, I would be remiss in saying this, Kite recognized our very own Dr. Kalman for his role as a pediatrician, advocate for pediatric mental health, a BOE representative, a strong champion of early childhood education, and dedication to Enfield. There will be a Dr. Kalman buddy bench placed at the Pearl Street Library, and the dedication will be tomorrow, May 10th at 1 p.m. So. That is very well deserved, Dr. Kalman. I can't be there tomorrow, but I will be there in spirit. But Mr. Ryder said he is going to be there to yeah. take pictures and support. So um, I also want to take a moment to thank um, the EHS Youth Vote Committee for hosting the program tomorrow evening, the 19th Amendment and its legacy 100 plus years ago. Um, I wish I could go. I was saying to um, Ms. Pickett and Mr. Ryder today, I think that May 10th became a popular day to just book everything. Um, we have Buzz tomorrow night. We have this tomorrow night. Um, we have a PTO president's meeting. Um, there's budget deliberations. Um, there is a number of things tomorrow night. So I know people are going to do their best to, to try to be um, everywhere. So if you don't see us, more than likely we're out at another event because May 10th all of a sudden became um, extremely busy. Um, I do want to take a moment to talk about the budget. Um, I appreciate Deputy Mayor Sakala. Um, sh she had sent me some correspondence regarding the recent budget deliberations. Um, and it's true, the Republican caucus wants to cut 1.4 1 1 million from the education budget. Um, there's from a suggested reduction in CIP projects and then there's like a town budget cut of 500,000. So it's frustrating to hear that there's a suggestion to reduce the BOE budget by a million more than the town budget. Um, so I did a little research. And I don't, I asked Mr. Drezek to prepare something. Do you have something? I don't know. Is there a way to have the public see this or? If not, that's fine.
Okay, that's fine. All right, so basically this sheet takes a left side comparison of the town budget and the town increase dollar wise and percentage wise from 2011 and 2022. The town increased their budget 3.13%. On the right side, it shows the school budget, the school dollar increase and the school increase percent. The school increased 1.31%. In the meantime, the average 10-year ten, inflation rate was about 2.28, which means that the schools weren't even funded close to the inflation rate. Here's a couple of years I wanted to point out. In 2012, the town had a 1.54% per, increase and the board had a zero increase. In 2014, the town had a 2.82% increase and the board had a 0% increase. In 2019, the town had a 4.68 increase and the board had a 0% increase. In 2020, the town had a 10.15% increase while the board had a 0.56 increase. In 2021, the town had a 2.77 increase and the board of it had 0.58. What I also like to point out is, and Mr. Drezik, step in or correct me if I'm wrong, a major factor of EPS staying afloat through those zero budget increases and through that minimal funding is most of our bargaining units took concessions. And I believe we have a union that's in a concession right now. Uh, we have a union that's currently in their second year of a concession. These but are teachers, the, administrators. Just to clarify, all of our unions have taken concessions during this term. So in the past years, while the town was getting funded, the BOE budget was given zero to minimal increases. But the only reason we got through it is because our own staff took concessions so that they didn't have to cut programs or constituents. Employees. Employees. I'm a townie. I've owned a home since 1996. Here's my question. Over 10 years, the town budget increased 10 million. Our budget increased, I'm sorry, 20 million. Our budget increased 10 million. Where did the $20 million go? There have been no added services. There's no more leaf pickup. There's no more, more adult daycare center. We have to pay for extra tipper barrels. Let's talk about all the new sewer fees. Every budget cycle, both the town and the BOE have mandatory increases and contractual increases, which are salaries, benefits, and health insurance. And that's all we ask for every budget cycle. We just always ask what's mandatory. There's no adding, there's no subtracting of positions and programs. So how does the town cover their budget shortfalls? So I had a great conversation with some of the democratic town councilors who had longevity on the town council. Capital improvement projects were not funded for the last 10 years. Capital improvement projects like buildings, parking lots, different things like that were taken off and put on the back burner, which includes our school buildings, all to cover budget shortfalls due to mandatory contractual increases. With the lack of capital improvements, um, we've had OSHA complaints on our school buildings. That's a fact because of leaks. The, health fund, the health claim fund was depleted and had to be built up again in order to pay, be able to pay employee health claims. I knew that. I didn't have to rely on a town councilor to tell me that. Our buildings, parking lots, and playgrounds are all in dire repair. And this is where I get angry. Because <laughs> I'm already angry, so I guess this is where I get more angry. The blame is falling on the current TC majority and the town manager. This has been 15 years of robbing Peter to pay Paul. This did not happen in November 2021. The town wants us to cut 1.4 million and they want to cut more capital improvement projects by 500,000. Oh yeah, Scott wants me to reiterate. The, the Democratic Town Council does not support the $1.4 million cut to school education. Granted, they have the votes, but I think people need to know what's being suggested to be slashed from our budget. I think it's important. I'm on a budget. I've put three kids through college. I have two in there now. Times are tough. Everything is more expensive. Inflation is out of control. For 10 years, I have sat on the Board of Ed and watched the Republican majority on the Board of Ed support cuts to education consistently year 
after year after year. Mr. Drezek, what does $1.4 million in cuts look like to this school district, please? Just off the top of my head, um, so the average, I mean, we're 85% staff. We're in the people business. Like we don't produce something physical. We're, so 85% of our budget is tied up in staff and programming. And the other 15%, whereas 20 years ago, people would say like construction paper and pencils, that now is turned into these things. And the iPads that our kids have and the licensing and things like that, that go like that. So to make a significant reduction like that, it would unfortunately have to be staff members. Um, the average savings of losing a staff member is about $55,000. So. $1.4 million would equate to about 26 staff members. If you average, I mean, every staff member is a little bit different. Could be more than that because obviously we have seniority in some of our bargaining units, which means unfortunately first in, first out. So lower, you know, less senior staff members don't make as much. So in order to make up that number, you would need more people. Um, trying to think about that, but in reality, that's what it would be, you know, assuming that would be the direction the board wanted to go in the event that that, that so came to fruition. The bulk of our money would have to come from staff, or it would have to be a combination of staff and programs. It would be a vast majority of staff and programs. There is not enough to cover a shortfall like that and just simply supplies, because like I said, a lot, it's not like we could just not buy copy paper anymore. We don't buy that much copy paper. Is that 20 years ago, we did. We had that kind of, I was in this room when we did that. Uh, a lot of the things that we classify as supplies now, they're all contractual obligations. They're leases for iPads. They're licenses for the programs that we use. Um, there's licensing for textbooks now as opposed to just buying physical books. So there's not a lot of uh, discretionary spending outside of staff and program. And when I mentioned staff, in order to run certain programs, you need people to do it. So it's everything from academic programs to extracurricular programs to things that we celebrate in this room that those are tough decisions that this group would have to make as to, and going back to where we started this process, um, there was a reason we changed the format a bit and the budget process this year was to kind of color code it. If you go back to the fuchsia, that's the stuff you're not required to do by law. Unfortunately, the blue, which we don't get a lot of mileage out of, those are things you have to do by law. So that would be the area that I would, we would start looking at. Um, but unfortunately, I think the answer is, yeah, it's going to be people and it's going to be programs because if I don't have people, I can't run programs. Now, how does the contract freezing impact the retention and hiring of teachers? Does that, I'm assuming, I mean, I can't imagine that helps. In, re in recruiting and retain retaining staff is terrible. Sorry, I'm being blunt. Um, you know, our, our turnover numbers are higher than they've been, and, and I can't say I blame. So you have to look at it from a, an employment standpoint, you know, one of the most expensive parts of doing a collective bargaining agreement are step movement for any of our bargaining units. And when you have step movement freezes, which our, our teachers have had repeatedly over the last you know, dozen years, um, hypothetically, you can have a teacher who's been here for 15 years, but they're on step nine, because that's just the way the contract runs. Um, but they have 15 years experience. So if a neighboring town in a teacher shortage, which you're in right now, can say, I can bring you in at step 15, that could be a thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 pay raise. I, we can't compete sometimes. And the people who have turned other jobs down, I can't thank them enough because of their loyalty to this community. But in reality, we, we've lost a lot of people because we're not as competitive. Does the lack of funding contribute at all to anything to do with the Alliance District? Yeah, we talked about it's that like last it, yeah. week. Um, I mean, again, it's not, I'm not pointing fingers, I, I, but I thought I explained that last week when we talked about the, the history of the Alliance Network and when you would ask me for this information, two reasons it goes far, that back, back that far. One, I pulled this directly from the town finance director's uh, website. It, the budget, anybody can look it up. It's all adopted budgets from, it only goes back to 11 and 12, or else I would have went back further based on the request that the chair had given me. Um, but it also coincides with the conversation we had two weeks ago of this, you know, the, the creation of the Alliance this network was 15 years ago. Or I was 12 years ago, I apologize. Um, when the needs of your kids are at a certain level, they require, and I think we all agreed last week or two weeks ago, was they, kid, our kids will require additional resources. When you don't have those resources, um, it, it makes getting your kids where you would like them to be and where they need to be more difficult, more challenging, because we don't have the resources to, to supply 
uh, to meet the needs of what the kids have. I know that's sometimes hard for people to hear and understand, but it's it's reality. It, it's what it is. A, a student with higher needs, they require additional resources. And if we don't have those resources, um, we have to, again, make either concessions, which we've done, or find another way to try to fund it or do the best we can. And that's that's essentially what happened. But it, you know, like we talked about last week or two weeks ago, sorry, you know, the, the accountability index, a big portion of that is based on, I, I actually left you guys all the document. I think it's on the way. I mean, the, the, the actual definition of the CAPS Alliance Network is the um, most economically disadvantaged towns in the state of Connecticut. It's, I gave it to you, you guys will have it. I didn't write it, that was given to me. So yeah, there, there's no coincidence that the 36 districts all have the accountability index based on social and economic status. It, and the, the, the community's ability to pay. So as we know, the town manager's budget increase was quite high. And as a long-term resident, I see that this high increase request is a result of lack of investment in long-range planning. I don't want high taxes here in Enfield, but I want to at least know where my money is going. This document shows the kind of value and investment we've put in education for the last 10 years here in Enfield. We should have been able to take perhaps small little baby steps over the years to support education, to support our infrastructure, steps to make Enfield better. We sat at that pre-K through modernization committee and they were talking about how education brings people to our town. But not if you're cutting it. Um, one other thing, thank you again to the town councilors that are not supporting this. I appreciate it. It's just very important to know the conversations that are having, that are, they're having in those budget deliberations because this is upsetting and people need to know. People need to understand. One of the things we talked about in leadership last night was there's a, this, and there's a thought that if our test scores were higher, we wouldn't be an Alliance district. That is also not true. So Mr. Dresick, could you answer to that again, please? As I said, um, the, the, the designation as an alliance district is a combination of the accountability index, which there's 12 indicators on there. And obviously, test scores are just one of them. Um, you know, clearly, we, we all aspire to have our test scores higher, but all our eggs are not in one basket. Uh, and a lot of that, um, and again, you don't have to take my word for it. By being an alliance district, again, us excluded because we didn't get any funding. So it's kind of hard to make that argument. but. Uh, in the traditional sense, one of the, when you're designated, one of the, the attributes of that is that you get money because you don't have it or you haven't spent it. Now, granted, with the exception this past year, we didn't get any, but that's a story for, we've been having that conversation now since it happened. Um, but part of the reason that there's a, a grant attached to the designation is because we have shown that we don't have the resources to meet the needs of our kids. Um, so that has been, you know, the, the nexus of not just what's happened here, but throughout the last year have being associated with other members of the, of the, of the Alliance network um, has been the consistent theme was those of us who have made progress, we've made progress because we've gotten an increase in resources. And if the state's not gonna give it to us, then we're gonna have to find a way to meet the, make them meet the resources meet the needs of the kids, which is clearly a challenge based on the conversation we're having here tonight. Right. Um, and lastly, how many positions do we have open that we have had a hard time filling? Open in total, uh, it's still kind of fluctuating. We're somewhere, depending on like non-certified, we've probably got well over 20, um, if not 30. Um, we've been shifting some responsibilities in areas where we can retain people and to maybe backfilling some others. Um, and then certified staff members, we've got about 11 right now that we can't fill. And some of those positions are needed. It's not something that we could not. Yeah, I mean, I think in years past when we've had some, some budget challenges, we've looked at attrition 
Um, and if the event, we have an open position and we don't fill it, that's somebody we don't have to lay off. I'll just pull the Band-Aid off. Uh, that's going to, that this year is going to require some, excuse me, I apologize, my mint's getting in the way. Um, allergies are bad. That, that's going to have some consequences for the community to understand. You know, we have a vacancy in a particular area at the high school. If we don't fill it, it simply means we're not offering that particular program. You know, I won't mention names or programs. Um, that might not be recognized now when the budget is adopted and the gavel's banged that people are going to think, well, the budget's done and it's, it's done. It's going to be next September when families show up and realize, well, wait a second, what do you mean my kid's not getting wood shop next year? That's the only reason my son wants to continue in school. I have had that what conversation with a parent recently. Well, if I don't have a tech ed teacher, yeah, we save the money, but we're not offering that program. The other piece is where are we putting these kids? One of the, the pillars of Enfield High School is we don't have study halls. It's something we're really proud of. And that community banded together, this community banded together to do that. But if we're not replacing teachers, I still need adults to supervise, but we have to start opening that conversation to study halls again. Again, for the positions if we were to choose to not fill the ones that are at the high school. Some of them are open, I'll be quite honest with you, they're in special education. So for every dollar you save and not replacing a person, add $10 to that because the process is going to make you pay for it anyway. Because those are services you're going to provide to a child one way or another. Whether you have a certified staff member or you don't, you go through the process and it's going to cost you 10 times that to do that. So it's penny wise and pound foolish. If we can find the staff to fill those jobs, that's another challenge. All of this is not helpful for recruiting. You know, the, the threat of possibly losing staff members, the, the again, the, the challenges that we've had by what the concessions over time have taken on staff, it, it, it's, all, it's all a challenge and it's all real. I know everybody's dealing with it, but, you know, we, we lose people every single day to surrounding communities or people who are willing to travel a little bit more because people are paying top dollar right now. And our hands are a bit. What's a little bit frightening is thinking about first year teachers listening to this and preparing their resumes. I have to remind the board, there is a process for non tenured staff members that the board has to notify them prior to May 1st. Um, and I'll take the heat for this. Prior to May 1st, you have to notify them in writing that they're non renewed, meaning you can't promise them a contract for next year. And the fallout of that is in the event you don't notify them prior to May 1st then, and you have to lay them off, you still have the ability to do that. The teacher then has the right to ask for a hearing or an explanation as to why they were non-renewed. We've taken a lot of pride in the last six years that I've never brought you that list. And I can still see Ms. Hall right now refusing to read yeah. the names. Yeah. Um, because we've had an agreement with the town that we weren't going to have to make um, you know, systemic cuts in order to lose staff members. And that's something that we as staff, as, as leadership in the district, as well as, um, you know, our, our bargaining unit leadership, have been very proud of we haven't had to do that. Um, you didn't do it this year. Right. We missed the deadline. So in the event we do have to lay people off, we're going to need to block off some time because any person who does would get unfortunately let go. And I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just saying that we're talking this as a possibility. Um, you would have to provide those employees the opportunity to be heard as the rationale. Now, it's in the letter, but they do have the right to call an in-person hearing with the, with the Board of Education in the event they want an explanation. Okay. Um, I would love to hear if you guys support the recommendation coming out of the, town, the Republican Town Council. I mean, I don't know if you need more information or you need more time, but I guess I want to know how you guys feel because we're here fighting for it to not be reduced and I just don't know how you guys feel behind it. Tina, in all fairness, we did not know about this. So Mr. Hamry, your comment about that we knew it and that Janet and I were ignoring it to Zach, I honestly did not know about this 1.4 million cut. I'm, I'm sorry about that because we spoke about it in leadership yeah. last night. So if that information didn't get to you, I apologize. That would be we're not communicating 1.4 million. Okay. Yeah. We talked about, we talked about, uh, Turn your mic on. Oh. Yeah, we did, we did talk about the budget, but I didn't give the specific number of what that comes. Okay. Was. That's understandable. If, if you didn't, if you didn't know, I wouldn't expect an answer, but if you did know, are you not wanting to answer Mr. Rongeyer or are you wanting to discuss it with your caucus or if you're supporting the 1.4? I think. I was in the leadership meeting yesterday, and um, I understand that you know we had 
we had uh, many years of zero, and then we had uh, some years where we did get some some things. But as I said earlier, I've got I've got full faith in in this process. Okay, and um, I'd like to see how they how it it's really out of our hands. I mean, we can we can talk what we want and this and that. You know, none of us want teachers being cut. None of us want you know our programs being cut. And I can say that, but as far as the dollars and cents that are that are, it's it's I've got full faith they're gonna they're gonna hammer it out they're gonna come up with an agreement, and that's just part of the negotiations. And uh, so, um, you know, I, I came out and I said well, I don't I don't I don't want to see anybody cut. Okay. Okay. And so. Thank you for that's answering. My position. All right. Um, that's all I have for this evening. Moving on to ten unfinished business item A, Mr. Ryder. Yes, uh, board members approved several first readings at our April 25th meeting. Tonight, policy committee members are recommending a second and final reading for these policies. There are four of them. So I am making a motion to approve the second reading of policy 5145.54 regarding civility. Do I have a motion to accept the second reading? Motion. A motion by Ms. Cree. Second. Second by Dr. Kalman. Any discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Cushman? Yes. Mr. Hamry? Yes. Mrs. Pickett? Yes. Mr. Ryder? Yes. Mr. Ungeyer? Yes. Mrs. Acree? Yes. Dr. Kalman? Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, I'm making a motion to approve the second reading of policy 6174 regarding the summer school policy changes. So moved. Second. Moved by Ms. Pickett, second by uh, Mr. Hamry. Any discussion? Roll call. Mrs. Cushman? Yes. Mr. Hamry? Yes. Mrs. Pickett? Yes. Mr. Ryder? Yes. Mr. Ungeyer? Yes. Mrs. Acree? Yes. Dr. Kalman? Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. Motion passes. Making a motion to approve the second reading of policy number 9321 regarding time, place, and notification of board meetings. So moved. Second. Moved by Ms. Pickett, second by Mr. Hamry. Any discussion? Sensing none, roll call. Mrs. Cushman? Yes. Mr. Hamry? Yes. Mrs. Pickett? Yes. Mr. Ryder? Yes. Mr. Ungeyer? Yes. Mrs. Acree? Yes. Dr. Kalman? Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. Motion passes. Making a motion to approve the second and final reading of this evening for policy number 9325.2 regarding order of business and meeting conduct. So moved. Moved by Ms. Pickett. Second. Second by Mr. Hamry. Any discussion? Sensing none. Roll call. Mrs. Cushman? Yes. Mr. Hamry? Yes. Mrs. Pickett? Yes. Mr. Ryder? Yes. Mr. Ungeyer? Yes. Mrs. Acree? Yes. Dr. Kalman? Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, moving on to number 11, new business. Item A, approve the EHS safe grad donations for the graduating class of 2023. Do we have a motion to approve... Uh, so, can I just kick it to Mr. Um, Dresick? Can you just explain that briefly to the the board what that is? Sure. Every year, the board um, it is within the board's budget that the board budgets a thousand dollars to make a donation to EHS SafeGrad on behalf of the Board of Education. But it takes formal approval every, annually for you guys to approve that donation. Perfect. Um, do I have a motion to approve the EHS SafeGrad donations for the graduating class of 2023? So moved. Moved by Mr. Ungeyer, seconded by Mr. Ryder. Roll call. Mrs. Cushman? Yes. Mr. Hamry? Yes. Mrs. Pickett? Yes. Mr. Ryder? Yes. Mr. Ungeyer? Yes. Mrs. Acree? Yes. Dr. Kalman? Yes. Madam Chair? Yes. Motion passes. Item 12, Board Committee Reports. Curriculum, Ms. Pickett? We will be meeting on May 18th, um, where we will be presented the new middle school health textbook and give an overview of the K-12 health scope and sequence. Finance Committee? Uh, Ms. Dr. Kalman? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the 2023 budget was reviewed, and the original budget was $73,275,252. Uh, the end of year projection is now 81000 uh, excuse me, $81,503,543. The main drivers of the differences were, as usual, uh, special education tuition, benefits, and staff. Uh, regarding the nutrition services uh, financial report, the net profit as of March was uh, $65,731.11, and net worth was $1,377,000. 
uh, $75.12. With respect to the TAG investment, the total value is now uh, $3,023,455.64, which is a gain of uh, $20,946 over the previous period. Again, for reference, our peak value was $3,510,000 in 2021. Um, there was a webinar on the state of the market, which was sponsored by the Wolf Financial Group, and it was given on May 2nd. Uh, you will remember that Wolf is managing our TAG investment. Uh, and in brief, the inflation is uh, slowly coming down, and this trend is expected to continue. But it's quite possible that a recession is still approaching. Uh, it will likely be mild. Uh, the consensus of all the three speakers was that investments should remain diversified, as ours are, and that uh, investors keep the long game in mind and not allow their emotions to dictate their decisions, uh, especially uh, in, this, uh, in these turbulent times. Uh, again, the consensus was to stay the course. Also uh, discussed was the possible impact of the debt ceiling uh, controversy. Uh, the three speakers felt quite confident, well, they did, <laughs> <laughs> that, that although we may come close to the brink, Congress will ultimately uh, raise the limit. We'll, we'll see. And that concludes my report. Policy Committee, Mr. Ryder. We will be meeting next week on May 16th. Okay. Um, the Leadership Committee met last night, and we'd be looking to meet um, the Monday before the next uh, Board of Ed meeting in June. Joint Facilities Committee. Our next scheduled meeting is May 25th. Right. Um, we were supposed to have one Thursday night, but be due to budget deliberations, it's getting pushed off. Um, the JFK Building Committee. Uh, their scheduled meeting May 4th was canceled. I believe they meet again next week. Joint Security Committee. Uh, to be scheduled after budget. Enfield Mental Health and Wellness Group. Uh, no report. Um, Enfield Cultural Arts Commission. Thank you. Uh, a couple of quick things. The ECAC uh, was uh, was very happy to be invited and uh, supported to uh, sponsored uh, in part the um, arts department and women's club event that we heard about tonight. So I want to uh, recognize ECAC for being one of the supporters uh, financially of that. Uh, of that effort and the, the scholarship uh, process. Um, the band shell behind town hall here that is um, in development, I'm not quite sure where it stands in terms of the physical structure being built, but that is a project that is still uh, moving forward, if I, if I understand correctly, should not be affected by anything budget related because it's ARPA funds that were uh, used for that. Uh, one of the interesting developments of that band shell and the concert series that the ECAC had been working on, I want to show some appreciation for the ECAC members that were uh, developing the concert series on a, as a month, uh, month by month concert series, once a month. Uh, they'd gone out to see some, uh, some entertainers uh, at an event in Manchester where they were gathered to demonstrate their music. <coughs> Excuse me. I apologize. Excuse me. Um, they uh, put the effort to uh, put the effort into uh, go out and do all this work as volunteers. I might ask, uh, might add, and um, the somehow the town manager's office got involved and with the uh, without the uh, participation. And I, I may be mistaken, but I'm, I'm sure I'll be corrected if I am. Uh, without any uh, participation of the chair, uh, the co-chairs of the ECAC. The town put together a weekly concert series uh, based on a lot of the uh, entertainment that is um, occurring in the area in other venues, and not the least of which is including the um, July 4th um, the, uh, celebration that we have here on the, on the town green. So um, there's so a concert series in development. Um, it's a little up in the air about uh, who's steering the ship. And I would respectfully ask for some uh, direction on that through uh, from the town council um, or the town manager. I'm not sure who's going to be able to answer the, the questions. Um, but back to the uh, bigger picture at hand in terms of the arts, I do want to, again, uh, appreciate the efforts that have been put forth through JFK for Newsies Junior, through the uh, Enfield High School Lamplighters, for the Sound of Music. Um, 
and elsewhere in town. There are so many things happening right now, including the uh, Opera House Players production of The Hunchback of Notre Dame. By all accounts, this past weekend's opening uh, weekend uh, was a phenomenal success, and the production is not to be missed. Um, one thing that the Opera House players have always taken pride in is bringing Broadway to uh, Enfield uh, or uh, wherever their home is at the time that they're uh, putting the shows together. But now that we have the benefit of having them in town, they are truly bringing Broadway level performances to our uh, Enfield annex. Um, and uh, the Valley Rep Theater is in uh, production this week, uh, coming uh, in Tech Week right now for a production of a uh, uh, play called Holidays, and that opens this Friday, uh, and uh, it's going to be just for the one weekend. Opera House Players is a three-week weekend thing, so plan accordingly. Uh, Holidays uh, at uh, as Nuntuck for Valley Rep is one weekend, and it's uh, again we're a wonderful production. I'm happy to be involved in all of the things here, except. Uh, Opera House players, but I volunteer with them regularly, so I'm happy to be able to see that one soon enough, too. Anyway, that's it for the ECAC. Thank you very much. Um, the pre-K through 5 school modernization committee, Mr. Drezek, do we have any updates on that? Uh, we're, wait, we're still waiting for confirmation that the bids had gone out um, through the finance office. Once it does, I think it would be prudent to recall the committee and start that process up again as far as um, reviewing what the next steps are. And actually, I'm, we're going to reach out to a special guest to maybe sort of give the committee some ideas on how what to expect moving forward. Okay, thank you. Did you hear that, committee members? We're going to be calling you soon, hopefully. Um, Mr. Ryder, do you have anything to add on? No, okay. Um, item 13, approval of minutes. Um, do I have a motion to approve the regular Board of Ed meeting minutes from April 25th, 2023? So moved. Second. second by Mr. Hamry, second by Ms. Pickett. Any discussion? Yes, just one quick item. On page 10, I had a question for the superintendent before the meeting started, so I didn't show you this, Kathy. Uh, but just on page 10 of the meeting minutes, uh, in the middle of the page, um, there was just a typo where it says, Mr. Ryder reported the policy committee met on April 18th, meeting again on April 16th. I should say May 16th, that's all. I'll bring it to you later. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the <laughs> minutes as amended? So moved. Moved by Ms. Pickett. Second. Second by Mr. Hamry. Show of any discussion? Any more discussion? Any more change? Show of hands. Thank you, Ms. Hall, for catching that. <laughs> I, I do catch these things. Um, item 14, approval of accounts and payroll. Dr. Kelman. Um, <clears throat> so certification of expenditures. The Finance Committee met. Uh, on May 1st, 2023, to review financial statements for the month of April, year to date, and to examine various documents related to finances. Our review concluded that there is nothing significant to report to the board. Motion, I move we accept the superintendent's certification as follows. I hereby certify that in the month of April, total expenditures amounted to $7,098,088.08. Broken down between payroll totaling $4,669,185.99 and other accounts totaling two million four hundred and twenty-eight, excuse me, two thousand four hundred and twenty no, two million two four hundred and twenty-eight thousand nine hundred and two dollars and nine cents. All payments have been made in accordance with the approved budget and are properly accounted for within the books of account. Copies of approval for check invoices are properly documented. So moved. Moved by Ms. Pickett. Second by Mr. Ungar. Show of hands. A certification of grants and Head Start expenditures. The Finance Committee met on May 1st, 2023 to review financial statements for grants during the month of April, year to date, and to examine various documents related to finances. Our review concluded that there is nothing significant to report to the board. Motion. I move we accept the superintendent's certification as follows. I hereby certify that in the month of April, the total grant and Head Start expenditures amounted to $544,243.14, broken down between payroll totaling $497,678.52 and other accounts totaling $46,564.62. All payments have been made in accordance with the approved budget and are properly accounted for within the books of account. Copies of approval for check invoices are properly documented. So moved. 
Moved by Ms. Pickett. Second. Second by Mr. Hamry. Show of hands. Item 15, correspondence and communications. We don't have anything this evening. Item 16, executive session. Mr. Dresick, do we have a need to go into executive session? We do not. And item 17, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Moved by Mr. Hamry. Second. Second by Ms. Pickett. Show of hands. The meeting has ended. Thank you.